what it is we're going to talk about. Anytime you hear a topic, you want to kind of try to dissect. Dissect the individual words in the topic so that will give you a clear picture of what it is we're going to talk about. We all know who Prophet Adam is, right? We all know who Prophet Adam is. Uh, what is a blueprint? When you say blueprint, what is a blueprint? A plan. A plan. Okay. Somebody else. It's a little more than a plan. What is a blueprint? What is a blueprint? Blueprint is, um, how would I say it? Uh, please written, put your cell phones on silent. Please put your cell phones on silent. It's a written uh, plan that outlines something that a person wants to build. Okay. Or do. Okay, good. So, we, we, we get a clear understanding of what a blueprint is. So, it's basically the design, all right? It's the design, the layout of something that you want to create. Something that you want to create, right? Anybody else want to comment on the word blueprint? Any construction workers in here? It's the map. Oh, here, right there. Okay. Right here. What is like, it? What do you want to say? It's sort of like uh, an exact, because usually it's on blue paper, they have the exact measurements okay. and angles okay. of how you're going to construct your building or your whatever it is you want to do. make yeah okay so when you hear the word blueprint you know two things that are going to come from that number one it's a layout all right and then it also has to do with something that is going to be built something that is not actually in existence at the moment it's an idea a concept of something that you want to create and bring into fruition right that's a blueprint so we kind of got the you know Understanding of what a blueprint is. Chip, will you want to say something about blueprint? What's his name? Ibrahim. Yes. Ibrahim. Was you want to say something about blueprint? You're a construction worker. What is yeah. a blueprint? Uh, blueprint is uh, the actual finished product. One corner of the every joint. Could look at, uh, could be a residential, commercial, building. Okay. Structural elements. Okay. Section, and also a legend. Uh, it's just like also all that. Specifications. All right, so it's the intricate details or the specifications of your layout of something that you want to bring into fruition, something you want to bring into existence that is an idea or a concept, right? So when we say Adam, the blueprint for masculinity, what, what is masculinity? What does that mean? Yes, young man, what is your name? What is your name? Huh? Hamza. Hamza. What is masculinity? What does that mean? A male or a boy. Okay. What is masculinity? Anybody else? Other than Hamza. Masculine is male. It's a male. Male person. It's a male person. Okay, yes. Manhood. Okay, what is manhood? Manhood is the life of a male to do how the individual develops over period of time. Okay. So how a male develops over a period of time. Okay. Um, when you talk about masculinity, um, you're talking about the inner personality of a human being. And of course, we're talking about the male here. So when we say Adam is the blueprint for masculinity, we're talking about Adam being the layout or the structure, the specified details of what it means to be a man. Okay? So looking at the topic, you can see where we're going with this. That Adam being the blueprint, the layout, the design of what a man should be. So, if I was talking about the topic of masculinity, why would I start with Adam? Why not with Prophet Muhammad? 
to love like each other. Why not with someone else? Why start with Adam? Adam said, He's the first human being to be created? Okay. What else? Why start with Adam? Yes. Because he was the first man to be ever made on this earth. He was the first man ever to be created and placed on this earth. He was the first man. So if you want to go to the you want to get to the root of a problem, you go to the origin. You go to the origin of it. So if we want to know what a man is, we got to go back to the original man. Who was the first man that was created? Because the first man that was created sets the precedence. He sets the standard of what every man that comes after him should be like. So if we want to know what a man is and who a man is and what a man should be or what a man looks like. And that's important for us today because the um, definition of, of man is being redefined all the time. Especially in the times that we're living in today. You ask today what a man is, you'll get a hundred different responses. And most of them are totally off point. So, you know, if we want to find out, you got to go back to the origin, to the hustle, to find out why did the law create Adam the way that he did? Because every other human being that was to come after Adam was to live in the blueprint, or to be designed by the blueprint of Adam. So as each generation passes, the physical stature of man continues to diminish. Morally, spiritually, and masculinely, reducing the male species, reducing the man to just the male species of little value. Especially in a society where masculinity is constantly being redefined. Especially in a society where masculinity is constantly being redefined by people who themselves have no testicular fortitude. And as a result of that, the definition of man is compromised by the social pragmatism as well as the moral decadence that we are constantly being bombarded with. Masculinity as well as femininity, it is a social construct. It is a gender category. The way that we are categorized in terms of gender. You have masculine, you have feminine, right? And as such, each gender role, each gender category comes with a set of rules or roles, values, and principles that make that particular category what it is. So if we say femininity or masculinity, two categories, there have to be a set of values and principles by which masculinity and femininity are defined. That's what happens when you put things into categories. And the traditional male role is constantly being devalued and soon to be completely obsolete as long as we as Muslims fail to observe our role as men in the community. We inadvertently validate the demeanor of those who try to rob us of our identity as men. I'll say that again. When we don't live up to our responsibility as men, we inadvertently validate the endeavors of those who try to rob us of our identity as men. And in the midst of it all, we fail to realize, or the people who tend to, who are embarking on this endeavor to rob us of our identity of, as men, as masculine men, all right? They fail to realize that you can't strengthen the weak by weakening the strong. So today, everything is focused on women. Raising women's status in society, giving women higher positions and so, and, 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 you know, economically, you know, on the corporate ladder, they're raising, they're raising. They're giving women more. They're strengthening the weak by weakening the strong. Which only leaves the women, which they don't understand, by themselves. Because there's nobody gonna be up there with you. You climb so high up the ladder, then once you get up there, there's nobody on your level. Which is why we're faced with situations now where many of the younger sisters that have master's degrees, 
PhDs, you're making good money, but no man is good enough for you. You've marginalized yourself, and you don't even realize what you're doing. And this is especially related to African American women. Because once they reach a certain level, economically, financially, as well as academically, no black man is good enough for them. So they have to venture over into another side. Unfortunately. And this is why it is imperative for us as Muslims to revisit the blueprint that was designed for our role as men, found in the most monumental stories of the Quran, and the story of the creation of the first man, Adam, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights the role of man with this statement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, بَعْعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانَ الرَّجِيمِ وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَائِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفًا And remember when your Lord said to the angels, this was before man was created, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ And remember when your Lord said to the angels, indeed I am going to create on the earth a khalifa. I'm going to create on the earth a khalifa. What is a khalifa? Khalifa means two things. One is من يخلف من بعده. The scholars of tafsir, they say the khalifa means two things. One is someone who will reproduce and leave an heir to come behind him. Because that's what the word يخلفو. Khalafa يخلفو. To leave someone behind, like a salaf, a predecessor. That you're a predecessor and then you produce another generation that pick up where you left off. So we are to be creatures that reproduce. And the scholars, they also explain that the khalifa is, another word for khalifa is imam. Someone who is to be a leader. A leader. Man is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was referring to. When he said that I'm going to create on the earth a khalifa, he wasn't talking about women, he was talking about men. He was talking about the first man that he was going to create who was Adam. And to show you that men were designed by nature to be the leaders, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every prophet and messenger that he sent to the earth came from the male gender. There was never a female prophet. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ إِلَّا رِجَالًا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِمْ فَاسْأَلُوهُ أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And we have not sent before you, O Muhammad, any messenger, except that he was a man. We have not sent before you any messenger except that he was a man. They always came from the male species. Here, going back to the first ayah, where, we, where he said that, he said to the angels, I'm going to create on the earth a khalifa. Talking about the man, he was to be the leader. In any endeavor, he is supposed to be the leader. And evidenced by the fact that every prophet and messenger, which is the highest position or status that any human being can attain in this life, is to be a prophet or a messenger. There is no status or title that is higher than that. And this is why the scholars, they say that people who say Sayyidina Muhammad, our leader or our master Muhammad, if we want to translate that in English, some people get angry when you don't say Sayyidina Muhammad, our leader, our master Muhammad. When you don't say Sayyid, when you're referring to Muhammad, you just call him Muhammad, some people get angry. Because they feel like Sayyid is an appropriate title for him. But you have to understand, him being a prophet is the highest title that a person can have. So by default that he is a prophet, any other title that you give him other than that is really irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether you call him Sayyid, whether you call him Mustafa, whatever title you give him, there is no title that you can give him that is higher than the title of prophet or messenger. 
And there's no gender equality in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the prophets and messengers from the gender of the men. Some people may look at that and say, well, that's uh, what they term today gender equality. Gender equality. Meaning it's unfair that we're giving men this status and not giving women the same exact status. There's no gender equality in this, and there's nothing misogynistic about it. As in Islam, every gender has its role. Every gender, it has its role. They don't have to be on the same level in order to be considered, they don't have to be on the same level in order to be considered equal, but every single one of them has their own particular role to play, and as long as you play your role, then you have been validated. Women tend to think that their validation comes when they compete with the man on the same level. So because she can be a president just like he's a president, now there's equality. There's nothing equality, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing equal about that. Equality is that you have your role, he has his role, and everybody has their responsibilities within that role, and that is what gives you equality. Not the fact that you can compete with me, I'm a construction worker, so the woman is going to put on a hard hat, and she's going to become a construction worker too, so that gives her equality. You are devaluing yourself because it is not your nature to put on a hard hat and become like the man. That's not your nature. You are stepping beyond the boundaries and the roles that God has given you. Seeking validation through man-made rules, man-made standards. And those are the standards that we try to live up to. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned in the authentic hadith, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَتِهِ فَالرَّجُلٌ رَاعٍ وَمَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتِهِ وَالْمَرَأَةُ رَاعِيَةِ فِي بَيْتِ زَوْجِهَا وَمَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَتِهَا The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, every one of you is a shepherd, every one of you is a leader, and every one of you is responsible for your flock. He said, the man is a ra'i, the man is a shepherd, he's a leader, and he's responsible for his household. He said, the woman is a ra'iya, the woman is a leader, but is she on the same leadership level as a man? No, she, but she is a leader in her own realm. In her own realm, she is a leader. The woman is a ra'iya, she is a leader, and she is responsible for her husband's home, and his children, and herself. She has her levels, of, she has her responsibilities. And that is what gives her equality. Not the fact that she can compete with the man on the same level. No. I just wanted to say one more thing. There's a confusion about the word equality and equity. Okay. And equity means if a person has a similar uh, skill, then they can do the same job. So I think a lot of people get confused with this concept of equity and equality. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did create the man and the woman different. Absolutely. But there's equity because you say a fasting man and a fasting woman, Absolutely. a praying man and a praying woman, a woman who gets charity and a man who gets charity. So there's equity in that sense, but not the same concept that we have in society that is equality. Absolutely. Because they'll say, well, a woman should get the same thing as a man here. But the Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, defines certain things. I'm sure you might get into that later, but I'm just wanted to bring that word because today in society, equity is a different word than you want. Absolutely. And the thing is, is that when we talk about leadership and having positions of authority, there's no uh, responsibility except that there's accountability. So even when we're talking about men and women being equal in terms of, you know, leadership and being on the same level, you got to understand there's a certain level of responsibility and a certain level of accountability that comes with every position of leadership. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَا مَنْ عَبْدٍ إِسْتَرَعَاهُ اللَّهُ رَعِيَّةً فَلَمْ يَحُطْحَ بِنَصِيحَةٍ إِلَّا لَمْ يَجِدْ رَعِيَةَ الْجَنَّةِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there is no servant who Allah makes him responsible over an endeavor or over a group of people, and he does not fulfill that responsibility except that he will not smell the fragrance of paradise. So if a woman wants to be on that level, she has to understand that there are consequences and there's accountability that comes along with wanting to be on that level. So, you know, it's not, you know, that we're putting, you know, both on the same level. 
However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the man to be a natural leader. That is his position as a man. And how many households today do you find Muslim men are not the leaders of their households? Their wives are. Could totally controlling everything that goes on in the home. How the children are being raised, how the funds are being spent, whether we can do this or we can't do that. All of that is in the hands of the woman. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you a khalifa from the very beginning. From the very beginning. And then you have men that are very docile. Men that are very, you know, that play the, the feminine role. Because the roles have been reversed to them. The men act feminine and the women are masculine. And that is by design of shaitan. As we're going to get into that. And this doesn't take anything away from the women. Because when you look at it, most of the, many of the prophets and messengers were raised by women. Behind every strong man is a strong woman. So we're not taking anything away from the woman because we're giving the man his due status. And this is subtract. As some people think, as the statement goes, that my success is your failure. <laughs> There's some people who have that mentality. When they see another person successful, they automatically associate that with the fact that I'm a failure. So they work very diligently to try to bring people down because in their mind, your success means my failure. That's not what that means. Because we give the man his due status, that does not mean that the woman is inadequate or irrelevant or invalid. That's not what that means. That just means that the man is given his due status. But that doesn't mean that the woman is inadequate or irrelevant. Because many of the prophets and messengers, some of the strongest men that have ever stepped foot on this earth, were raised by women. Especially the Ulul Azmi Min al Rusul, the five strong prophets, the five prophets of strong will. Starting with uh, Prophet Isa, salam, raised by his mother. He had no father. He was born into this world, and the only one he knew was his mother. And look at the type of individual that he became. I'm talking about the Islamic version of Jesus. Not the version of Jesus that many of the Christians try to portray of this docile, humble, you know, almost meek and weak type of individual. That wasn't Jesus the way that he is described in the Quran. But where did that come from? He was raised by his mother. Prophet Musa, they said that, raised by his mother. Raised by a strong woman who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded her, throw your child in the river, in the Nile River. We will return him back to you. And she believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She threw him in the river. That's a strong woman. And subhanAllah, look at how Allah returned Musa back to him. Musa alayhi salam, when Fir'aun and his wife Asiya found Musa, Musa as an infant, he would not breastfeed from any woman. SubhanAllah. He wouldn't breastfeed. They brought wet nurses in to try to breastfeed Musa. He would not feed from any woman. So Asiya knew a woman that lived in another village, and she was known for breastfeeding children, and it happened to be Musa's mother. Musa, as an infant, he smelled the breast milk of his mother. And that was the only breast that he would feed from. And that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returning Musa back to his mother as he promised her. SubhanAllah. And Allah, that Allah does not fail in his promise. When Allah promises you something, he is going to come through on his promise. SubhanAllah. But he was raised by a mother. He was raised by a woman. Look at the type of individual that Musa came. Musa came as a strong man. Look at the type of person he was, that he became. So, he was raised by a mother. Jesus was raised by a mother. Prophet Ismail, alayhi salam, raised by his mother. Ibrahim, alayhi salam, left Ismail and his mother in the valley of Mecca. And he went off to the area of Sham, of Palestine, and Syria to go give battle. And left them in the valley of Mecca with nothing. A water skin in a few days. To the point where, when Ibrahim turned around and walked away, he couldn't even look his wife in the face. His wife kept calling him, Ya Ibrahim, he never turned around. Until his mother said to him, 
Allahu amraka bihada, did Allah command you to leave us? And Ibrahim he turned around and he said, yes. She said, then go what your Lord told you to because he will never leave us by ourselves. SubhanAllah, look at the strength of this woman. And look at how she raised Ismail. When Ibrahim came back, Ismail was a grown man. This woman raised him to be a strong man. So we're not taking anything away from a woman. He, Prophet Muhammad he was born an orphan. His father died six months before he was born. He was born into this world and the only one he knew was his mother. And look at how she raised him. Look at the type of man that he became. So we're not saying, we're not taking anything away from a woman when we give a man his due status. And this is something that women, because when you start saying things like this, women start getting offended. Nobody's taking, somebody's success does not automatically mean your failure. But as Aisha Holy Allah she said, We have been commanded to put everyone in their proper place. We have been commanded to give everyone or put everyone in their proper place. And that's all we're doing. We're, redef we're defining the original, the traditional roles of men and women according to the Quran and the Sunnah based upon the standards that God has set, not the standards that man has set. Because man's standards has already proved, you know, flawed. Which is why we keep changing the standards every other year. We've proven that man's standards are flawed. All the time. Because we're constantly changing the standards all the time. Throughout the story of Adam, and Islam, we will find key elements that define Adam as a man. Elements that are being discarded today, one by one, and viewed as intrinsically valueless by those who are working hand in hand with Shaitan to create a system that upsets the spiritual and religious norms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set from the very beginning. A system that is paving the way for the emergence of the Dajjal. The first thing. I'm going to give them to you in numbers. Make it easy for you guys to follow along. First thing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam from what? What did Allah create Adam from? I want some of the, the guys in the back. I want you guys to participate. I don't give didactic lectures. I want you to participate. I want to know that you are paying attention, that you are following me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam from what? Huh? Yeah. From dirt. From dirt. Dirt is the lowliest substance on the earth. It's underneath your feet. You walk on it. When we walk and we get dirt on our sneakers, dirt on our shoes, every time we see that, that should be a reminder to us of where we come from. That should be a reminder to us where we come from. Sometimes we get dirt on our shoes and we brush it off like it's nothing. And the thought never crosses our mind, that's where your origin is. That's where you come from. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam from the lowliest substance, which is dirt. And that is to constantly remind us of two things. Number one, that dirt is where we was created from, and that is where we will return. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Minha khalaqnaakum wa fiha nu'indukum wa fiha nu'indukum wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And from the dirt we created you, and from the dirt you, and to the dirt you will return, and from the dirt we will raise you up. From it we were created. To it we will return, and from it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise us up again. 